hello. We are starting a new vlog today. Oh, I'm excited about this one. I think that it was a, a fun concept that I've had for a while and it finally felt like the right moment to do it. I am a little nervous about how some people are gonna take the spirit with which this is offered. So we'll talk about that a little bit, but I was doing a little tarot spread for myself the other day. It was a five card spread. And when I looked at it, I realized that almost all the cards were Arcana cards. And if you have never encountered tarot before, there are some decks that are very minimal, whatever. But the one that I have is the, I think it's the Smith Waite deck, which is the kind of traditional one that uh, was created, I believe in the twenties. And I just love the art in it. I think it is absolutely beautiful. And I've always thought that it would be fun to use the cards as a prompting for vlogs. So like a sort of secret TBR, but using tarot cards as the prompts. And when I got this spread the other day, it was almost all Arcana cards, which are some of the most fun artwork in the deck. So I thought, you know what? The tarot, I feel like has just chosen my TBR. So I'm going to read one book for each card and we will talk about how each of those are going to be inspired for my bookish picks. But I do want to mention that I will have a little section at the very end of the vlog. Like, so if you just want reading vlog, you can stay and not have to hear any of this. I'm going to talk a little bit about why I was doing that particular spread and kind of like where I am with the seriousness with which I take this particular form of spirituality, I guess is the way to say it. And I also just want to tell you that if you are somebody who takes tarot very seriously, either in a, this is like an important part of my spirituality, or I'm scared of it because I think it's like bad and you're just not comfortable with the concept of this video. Video, that is totally fine. I send you off with love. You are welcome to exit out now. And I'll talk a little bit more about kind of my own feelings about tarot itself towards the end. But this vlog is mostly going to be funsies and vibes. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about what each card means and like how they're inspiring the bookish picks as we go. But I just thought that this would be kind of a fun way to pick a TBR. So I will check back with you when we do our first book uh, for our first card. And the first card is the Hermit. Okay, I literally just finished filming my cat vlog wrap up. So now it's time to start my tarot card, picks my TBR project. And for the Hermit card, I am picking Piranesi because I think he's alone-ish in this big house. So like there's some solitude. He's a character in solitude. But then also I think that this is very like philosophical and questing. I think that's sort of the tone, which I feel like goes with the Hermit card. And maybe I should like pause at some point to give you the rundown on the Hermit card or on each of the cards and like why I'm picking them. Also Hastings moving my camera. He's celebrating his victory by annoying me. Anyway, just wanted to tell you that I'm getting started on this soon. So we are starting our journey with the Hermit card. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the Hermit card, shall we? And why I think Piranesi is turning out to be like a fantastic pick for it. I thought it would be based on the description, but after actually understanding the content, it definitely is. So the Hermit card is the following your own principles card. So if counsels you to follow your own path and principles. It can appear when you feel lost, but it says that you are not lost at all, but you just need the time and space to allow factors to emerge. So this idea of like inner spiritual journeying, it's the seeker of truth card. Uh, it's about guidance, solitude, inner wisdom, self-evaluation. And when the hermit appears in a reading, it can mean a guide figure is at hand offering help. The card advises you to meet this guide or to begin your own search for truth. Sometimes the guide figure is a person, like a counselor, therapist, whoever, but usually refers to inner guidance. The hermit can recommend withdrawing from the busyness and distractions of the outer world to do some soul searching. So Piranesi fits that honestly to a T. It's been a long day. I had to actually go into the office in person. Gasp horror. So I had to do that and then I came home and was wrapping things up here. But anyway, you don't care about that. We care about the book. So really like this. We're starting off strong. This is a really interesting book and I it, I'm trying to think if I've read something quite like this before. I'm not sure that I have, honestly, in terms of sort of how it incorporates its fantastical elements. 
ultimately into the story. It went somewhere that I was not expecting it to go. I kind of had a hypothesis about the direction that this would take and I was incorrect. So that was exciting to be sort of proven incorrect. This is the kind of book that you can either read or at least I tend to either read very slowly and very deeply or I kind of just let the language wash over me and just sort of go with it. And that was kind of the approach I took for this. This is something that I could easily see myself doing a reread with like a book club or something and really getting into the nitty gritty of all of the language here because it's incredibly dense, I guess is maybe the word I want to use for it, but it doesn't have to be read that way. I think you can read this as almost, it has almost like a fable-like quality to it and that I think allows you to sort of just go with it and not try to understand and catch every single detail of every single description that's given because a tremendous amount of detail is given about the statue and the tides and all, like all of these different things in this labyrinthine world that we don't really know much about and you kind of just are disoriented but it's that purposeful disorientation that I really like. But when I can tell that an author is in command of something that I don't understand yet, but they are communicating that like, stay with me, I'm gonna get you there, don't worry, we're gonna land the plane. I really enjoy that quality and this had that. So I actually really enjoyed this a lot. I don't know that emotionally I was fully connected with it because of how confused I was at points. So I wouldn't quite go to like a four and a half, but this is a very, very strong four star. I think this has a lot to say about our own interiority, about um, what we do and don't want to believe, about belief in general. Yeah, about how we stick to things. I'm trying to, I, I it's like, I, w I don't want to give spoilers on this. Basically, I would just say that I think that this is metaphorically rich because of how somewhat vague it is. I will also tell you that I think this is pretty funny. Like there's little details that are included in this that made me laugh out loud. So I also appreciate the sort of like dry humor almost that the author brought to it. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. This was really, really good. Very glad that this prompt compelled me to pick this up because I totally understand why this was such a big hit last year. And I think it's a book that not everybody would enjoy, but for me, it really worked very well. So anyway, good start to our project. And now our next card is the death card. Now, we can, we'll do a sidebar on the full meaning of the death card, but for now in terms of my pick, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, well that would be perfect for a mystery pick. And I was going, I, I wanted to either do something that had death in the title or something that had some sort of very violent imagery with it. So I almost with In My Dreams I Hold a Knife because I felt like that was one of the most violent titles, but I couldn't resist the fact that Death in the Dancing Footman by Nio Marsh is one that I have been meaning to read for a very long time and it's an isolated close circle mystery which is one of my favorites and it has death directly in the title so I decided that this would be what we would actually pick but this is like maybe the easiest one to pick a book for because yeah death very easily lends itself to an entire genre of book. So last time we picked based on content and this time we're picking based on content but also specifically the title. So this will be the next one. Let's talk about the death card and the fact that mine is in reverse for this reading. I will say that is pretty hilarious because anytime you look up anything about these cards for the death card in particular, every single one is like, note, everyone like in bold is like, death card does not equal literal actual death. They want to be very clear with you that you don't have to worry about like getting hit by a bus if this comes up in a reading. The good little summary here is the death card usually represents a door you need to close on a situation or relationship that is holding you back from finding happiness, a loss that will be painful but will free you. And that really, the death card is really about transformation. So it's about, it is, it's usually more like metaphorical death. Now I'm sure if a death card came up in a reading and then somebody literally died, potentially in that case, it might end up getting construed as being literal. But in general, it's more about change. So like, for instance, if you were asking about something at work and you got the death card, probably that would be like, hey, it's time to move on from that job kind of a 
vibe. Like, yeah, okay, it says if a reading is about your work, this card symbolizes a transition in your career path, a job change, or a major shift. The other thing is we've, this is the first reverse card we're gonna see in this reading. And reverse, some people don't do anything with reverse. I tend to err on the side of thinking reverse is significant. So it says that if the death card is reversed, it suggests that you're putting off making necessary changes, usually out of fear. You're stuck in old habit patterns that you know need to be revised, but you don't want to put forth the effort to alter them. So obviously I'm going with a more literal like death literally being in the title interpretation, but if I had wanted to go more with like the content, I would have, you know, maybe picked like a shifter book, which technically, as you will see, would be appropriate for how this ended up playing out. But like something about transformation, change, but in this case, because it's reversed, I guess delaying putting off change would have been the move for using the meaning of the card to inspire the pick. Well, hello, my friends. I finally finished this book. It took me far too long for several reasons. Well, one, I got distracted because I got my arc of Storm Echo. That came in, that was very exciting. And so I took a detour in reading plans so that I could prioritize reading that. But I've also, I've been reading this for like, a lot longer than I would normally read a book of this length. And it's because it's honestly, it was just pretty boring. I mean, I don't really know what to rate this because it's competent. I can see who might like it. So I guess I should tell you what this is about. This is Death and the Dancing Footman. And I got it because I thought it was an isolated close circle mystery. And it somewhat is, I would just, I'm probably gonna reclassify it to an almost isolated close circle mystery in my Goodreads list because I don't think it truly honors like what I like about that trope. Basically the setup is really cool. I actually liked the kind of ramp up, but then it got very tedious. But so basically homeboy Jonathan, super fucking rich. He is having a house party and he's purposefully inviting people who he knows do not get along. And he also invites his friend who is a playwright and he's like, maybe this can inspire your next play. So that's a fun setup. And it actually reminds me of my favorite Agatha Christie setup ever, which is in Cards on the Table. Mr. Shaitana invites four people who he thinks committed murders and got away with it. And he invites four detectives to a night for bridge. So it's, you know, it's a fun setup. And also the weekend that he picks, it seems like it's gonna snow. So he's like, ooh, even if they get here and they're mad, they're not gonna be able to leave. So, okay, that's kind of the setup. And then like eventually murderousness ensues. It takes way too long for there to be murderousness. And it doesn't read like a psychological murder mystery or a psychological thriller. So it's, I don't know, the pacing is just really, unsatisfying in my opinion. Like I, yeah, I don't know. The more I'm talking about this, the more I'm like, I kept reading. <laughs> I did not enjoy it. Okay, the positive things. Well, I was very intrigued in terms of this as like a product of its time. It said, it was written in 1941. And one of the conflicts is that there's this rich woman who 20 years earlier had severely botched plastic surgery. And he also invited the plastic surgeon who did the botching. And I thought for the forties, that was like an interesting little detail. I knew that there, plastic surgery existed in this period, just from like, like Hollywood biographies that I've read before, but I guess I didn't realize it was so common. And it was funny because as I forget early on somewhere, he says like, oh, you know, it was 20 years ago before they had such good techniques as they have now. And it's like, okay, well you would have your mind blown by the, all the fillers and Botoxin and whatever we've got today. Anyway, that I guess was interesting. I don't know. I just, I was annoyed. I was bored for a lot of this. It took me way too long to read it, even though I had plenty of opportunities. I was snuggled with the kitties. It snowed this weekend. So that like made it extra cozy for reading. I don't know. I just, I did not really get along with this book very well. Another petty thing that annoyed me is the fact that every time the room that was called the boudoir was mentioned, it was in quotes. Like, let me see if I can find it. I was like, guys, I get it. 
Also, you're you're putting it in quotes in dialogue. Nobody can see the car. Is it focused? I can't tell. Hopefully it's focused. But I'm just like, oh my gosh, guys, over and over and over again. I get it, it's the fucking boudoir. All that to say, I did not really enjoy this. I thought I was gonna give this a three, but as I've talked it through with you guys, I'm gonna give it a two, because I didn't really enjoy it, and I'm pretty disappointed. And it took a lot of time for me to get through for reasons unknown. At least I'm done with it. It's been on my TBR for quite some time, so I guess that's good. Yeah, we can move on. Really enjoyed the, my first pick for this vlog. Did not enjoy this. Hopefully I will have more success with the next one. I think I will because it's a book that was recommended to me, but I won't spoil it. I'll wait until we're actually gonna talk about that book and tell you what it is, but I think it'll be good. Alrighty, so it's the next day, new day, new me, and I'm ready to try something different. And our card this time is the Page of Wands. And I knew that I wanted at least one of these to be pretty, like abstract's not quite the right word, but just like more taking the spirit of the card, trying to find something that kind of reminded me of the spirit of the card rather than more one-to-one -one on the content. So we'll talk more about what Page of Wands is, but I chose, I knew I wanted something based on the vibes to be light, easy breezy, like optimistic, upbeat. So that clearly says romance. And just sweet was the word I had in mind. And I remembered I had a romance on my TBR called Sweet Hand by N.G. Pelletier. This was recommended to me highly by Jess Owens. This, is, this was one of her faves last year. I feel like hopefully vibe wise, this is going to meet the kind of intention that I had for this pick. But considering our last one was sort of a letdown, I'm glad <laughs> this I think I'm hoping is at least a shoe in to be fine, if not good or great. I'm hoping Jess wouldn't totally steer me wrong uh, in that respect. So yeah, this one, let's see here. After a public meltdown over her breakup from her, her cheating musician boyfriend, Sharice swore off guys in the music industry and dating in general for a while, preferring to focus on growing her pastry chef business. And then let's see, okay, her younger sister's getting married and her mother's matchmaking keeps intensifying and the run up. She keep she's had like a hate to love situation with this guy named Kirian King, the most annoying man ever. And they're on the island together for the f at the same time. Voiding him is impossible, especially when Kieran's close friend is the one marrying her sister and he's the best man to her maid of honor. Let's see here. They've always butted heads to him. She's always been a stuck up brat, even when he secretly harbored a crush on her, of course. Now with Sharice's sister marrying one of his good friends, he can't escape her as the wedding activities keep throwing them together. And then things turn heated. So yeah, I think that this seems like fun. It's on an island. So I'm into those vibes considering we're in sort of like fake spring right now. Hopefully this will be a hit. Uh, it will also talk more about Page of Wands and why the vibe I was looking for was easy breezy, fun, sweet, good. Okay, so Page of Wands is an optimistic card. This is one that I was a little trepidatious about what I was gonna do for it because the Arcana cards are pretty like on the nose. They're pretty direct in terms of what is inspiring them. But the suit cards, I think are not as obvious somewhat in terms of what could be inspiring them. But if a person in your life, the page of one of any age is constantly changing mood, moving location, seeking new activity and friends, and then moving on to a, the next wonder of life seemingly at a whim, it signifies the emergence of new creative dream. I kind of get like Sagittarius type energy based on this description, but I really went more with this description, which is the page of one represents the early stages of a situation or undertaking. It shows an optimistic attitude, enthusiasm, and an eagerness to succeed. If the card represents a person in your life, it could be a younger relative or friend, an apprentice, student, or assistant. It's also known as the student card. And so that's part of why I was like, oh, okay, new things, optimism, that seems like kind of like a romance because usually romances are set at the beginning of a new relationship relationship where you hopefully are filled with optimism about your new love. And it does say if you asked about love, this card indicates an innocent and playful approach to a relationship. It shows openness, honesty, and optimistic attitude about love. So that's why I was thinking something sort of just like sweet, like a sweet romance kind of energy to it. And then like a page or a princess usually means that the person in question is younger and most romance novels focus on, you know, people in like their 20s or 30s. So anyway, that is a little bit more about the Page of Wands and how it led me to my pick. Good. 
Good morning, my lovelies. I just got out of bed. I've left the kitty cats. Say, Mom, why did you leave? Come back to bed. I know, I didn't want to leave either. And the warmth of my bed <laughs> to have to work. Why, why must we work? I did finish this last night and I really enjoyed it. This is really cute. And this was exactly what I was looking for in terms of just like something sweet. It was, it was just optimistic and sweet and lovely. So Cherry and Carrion have, I think a nice sort of like bantery hate, but just like dislike to love kind of journey. She has an adorable kitty named Jello who is on the cover adorably. And you will note that Jello is a calico. Calicos are almost always girls, but hers was a boy. Anyway, random <laughs> observations with Mara. Yeah, I liked that. They have a friend named Eric. He's gonna be Cherry's brother-in-law. And he says that they're his OTP. I thought that was cute. I don't know. There was lots of cute little details in here. The sexy times were, you know, they gave what they needed to give. Just overall, this was fun. I don't know that this was like the most remarkable or the most memorable to me, but I did enjoy it. And yeah, I would give it like, it's like a B plus to me. I would give this three and a half and would recommend. Yeah, just overall, if you're looking for a nice, sweet romance, in the sense, not like, I don't like that, by the way, that sweet is used to mean non-sex. In romance lingo, that is traditionally what that means in a romance. If it's a sweet romance, it means that there's not any sex in it, which I don't like because books with sex can also be sweet. And this is one of them. I thought that this was just lovely and pleasant. If you're looking for a romance set uh, in, I think it's in Trinidad, somewhere in the islands, and there's baking and it's a big, like lots of good friend group stuff because it's them with all of their friends who are in Eric and Ava's wedding. Yeah, I just think that this was a nice time, a good time. What, I, I don't know what else to say. I enjoyed this, this was fun. So that gets us through Page of Wands. And next up is a tricky one because the next one is the Empress in reverse. So, I think it's gonna be a day or two before I actually get started on my Empress pick, but I don't know which one I want to choose because, well, basically Empire of Sand is by Tasha Suri and is very recommended to me from a lot of people. And it's like a fantasy romance kind of deal. I have it as a five-star prediction. I really would like to get to this, but if we're talking like what book strictly fits the prompt, I mean, this is literally called The Empress of For Salt and Fortune. So I probably should pick this. So I'm a little torn, but I have a day or so before I'll get started on whichever one of these I pick. So I'll mull on it and decide if I'm more concerned with sticking to the prompt or if I wanna make some progress on a book I've been meaning to get to. So I'm conflicted, we'll see kind of where I go. Both of them are fantasy, both of them are very recommended. This one I think is more of a romance than this is, but yeah, we'll see. Okay, so we are dealing with the Empress card now and I got it in reverse, which is why I really wanted this to be a content driven pick or like a vibes driven pick, but I struggled with this one. So I ended up going more title literal, but this is the card. It's so pretty. I think of these, it's maybe my favorite of the artwork. I'm not sure. It's very, very pretty, but the Empress card is the nurturing others card. And it's very much linked to kind of more literally with pregnancy fertility. You know, it's like the mothering card basically. So some of the keywords are creativity, feminine power, mature women, fertility, pleasure. The Empress represents feminine power in the material world, whereas the High Priestess card represents feminine power in more of like a spiritual world. It's the card of beauty, creativity, it's also depicted as the universal mother. But what really threw me off here is that it's in reverse. And it says the Empress reverse reminds you to nurture yourself. Have you been spending too much time caring for others or other people's demands wearing you out? Are you neglecting your own personal needs? This is a card of the exhausted woman who's trying to balance a full-time career with caring for children and her home. So I had a couple of ideas for that, but not really. So I decided that we were just gonna go pretty literal with the title on this one, but I'm kind of sad. Like I also was looking to see if I could find any covers that had like, that reminded me visually of what this card looks like. And I couldn't really find one. So, you know, we did, we got there. We got appropriate picks, but I was kind of hoping I was gonna get to, 
use this one as a vibes or as a, a content one. Cause I also, I felt like I was trying to think of if I had anything that was about like creativity or finding a good balance in life. I mean, I'm currently listening to work. Laziness does not exist and work won't love you back, which I guess could maybe go with this. Anyway, we landed in a good place in the end. Hey, I did end up going with Empress of Salt and Fortune just because, I mean, it's in, the, I just, it felt like it was the right choice considering it was the Empress card. And I really, really like this. So this is a high fantasy about the Empress, the titular Empress, who is from a foreign country and is brought in to basically like produce an heir and is then tucked away into a faraway estate. And she has died. And there is this cleric who is going to that estate to try to document what can be found of her life there. And when they get there, they discover that there is a handmaiden of the Empress who is still living there. She is very old now and her name is Rabbit. And so Rabbit is slowly like telling the story. And so it's sort of like a story within a story. And each chapter starts with like little kind of an inventory of things that they're finding at the estate. It sort of ties into the themes of that piece of the story. So yeah, it's an Asian inspired setting. And I thought that was an interesting, added some interest in terms of the fantasy world. You guys know that I love non-basic bitch medieval fantasy worlds. I don't know, this felt sort of like a fable. There was this repetition of, do you understand? Are you understanding? Like that was sort of a thematic repetition in the story. And I don't know, I feel like this is sort of like a high fantasy feminist take. You know, the back cover says, at once feminist high fantasy and an, and an indictment of monarchy. So yeah, like I do think that this is a lot about what leaders ask of their people. Is it too much? Who gets to decide who is in a position to ask those things? Editing me popping in to say also that I don't think, I was re-watching the description of the Empress card, and I actually think that this book ended up accidentally, like not through my own purpose, uh, ended up thematically being very on point with the Empress card in reverse in terms of putting other people's needs before yours, being very centered around mothering, because a big part of the Empress's story is how she is kind of like this vessel to produce an heir, but she doesn't get to connect with that child. And then like, she's kind of used and discarded. So I think that that bit in terms of some of the themes of this book accidentally ended up being very on point for the Empress card. So, you know, fortuitous, the stars, etc. I feel like this accidentally ended up being a content and theme pick, even though I was going for just literally the name of the book. So, you know, fortuitous, it all came together on this one. Yeah, I don't know. There's sort of kind of like a fable-like quality to this. I just really like this. I would definitely, I think that there's more. I think that there's like a sequel to this and I would read that. Yeah, just overall, this was good. It's really short, so I kind of don't want to tell you more about it because I think you should just sort of get into it and read it. But yeah, if you're looking for sapphic fantasy, if you're looking for Asian-inspired fantasy worlds, or just like non medieval European settings. If you're looking for sort of like a different format for the storytelling, or if you're looking for something pretty short, I think this could be a good pick. So yeah, I enjoyed this. I think I'd probably give it like four stars. Yeah, this is really good. I think I would read more. This was an enjoyable one. I think that does it for the Empress. So now our last card is the Hierophant. That is going to be the last book we read. Okay, let's pick our Hierophant slash Pope card pick. And Hastings is here supervising. Okay, so since the Hierophant card is also known as the Pope card, it felt like I should go with something related to the Pope slash Catholicism. And I have three choices, and I'm conflicted because the one I most want to read I think is not as direct, but hear me out. Okay, so we have Catholicism by Henri de Lubac, and this is a theologian from 
like kind of the post Vatican II era that was very influential in terms of like resurfacing early church father teachings. He this is a book I've been meaning to get to for a long time. So I mean, it's literally called Catholicism, right? Like, I feel like this is pretty on the nose. So I think that would fit really well. Vows of Silence, uh, the abuse of power in the papacy of JP II. This one is about the abuse scandals in the church and specifically having to do with the Pope himself. So again, if I'm picking which of these I think fits the best, it's probably this one. And I do think this will be interesting. The one that I want to read <laughs> is American Heretics, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, and the History of Religious Intolerance. This does, so it is about Catholicism in the US. And I do think it has to do with like orthodoxy because, you know, it's heretics. So I do think that this would be on point. Am I just convincing myself? Okay, it's supposed to be inspiring the picks, and I wouldn't have gravitated to this without the card. So it counts, right? I want, this is the one I want to read. I think this is the one I'm going to read. Okay, book selected. Okay, our final card is the Hierophant, and this card is also known as the Pope card, but this edition or this deck shows it as the Hierophant. And the Hierophant is sort of like the masculine and spiritual equivalent of the Empress. So the Empress is the card over physical, like it's maternal energy over the physical realm. And the Hierophant or the Pope is the male energy over the spiritual realm. It's also referred to as the traditional path card. Hierophant is the brother and alter ego of the emperor and is a source of wisdom, spiritual and traditional knowledge and experience rather than authority and material success. If you are considering a course of study or training that may be long and difficult, this will lead to a more fulfilling career or life. He also favors learning and practicing teaching, spirituality, or psychic development. He can signify a wise teacher or a counselor or a spiritual or professional advisor. So yeah, in terms of my particular reading, I took this one line. Basically, this is like not being afraid of traditional spirituality. It can be that he, he may represent a person who's dedicated to a religion or philosophy or he can indicate that you're trying to break away from religious influences and dictates. In a broad sense, this, this card can refer to any organized institution, religious or otherwise, that exerts authority over its followers. So I think the inspiration here is pretty clear, especially with its alternative name being the Pope card. But that's a little bit about this one and why it inspired what it did. Well, hey guys, checking in since we last talked, two big updates. One, I have a bonus book that I read and loved, which is Empire of Sand. I kept thinking about it. And while I enjoyed The Empress of Salt and Fortune, no regrets there. I just, this is on my five-star prediction list. And I was like, okay, I feel like this is the cards, the universe, whatever, telling me it's time to read this. And I loved it. It's so good. Oh, it's so good. So just kind of like a bonus thing. If we're including this in the video, this is definitely my favorite so far. I'd give this like four and a half over time. Maybe it'll end up being five stars if I keep thinking about it. But it's the perfect melange of fantasy and themes and characters and love. Sp mild spoiler, I guess, ish, because I'm gonna read you a passage that killed me towards the end of the book. So when you're seeing spoiler on the screen, I'm gonna read this so you can skip if you don't wanna hear that. But you don't need to court me, but I'd like to, he said, his gaze clear, his voice steady. I want to court you every day. I want to choose you and to ask you to choose me and know that we are bound because we have chosen each other. I want to know we are bound because we continue to choose to belong to one another. I don't want to see the world. I want to see our future. I want to see you. <laughs> I'm dead. I am actually dead from that. And the moon is my sweet little peach. God, I love him. Okay, 
So anyway, all that to say, I really enjoyed this. This was absolutely fantastic. But I have also made a lot of progress on American Heretics. I am flying through this. This is super readable, super easy to read. And I think that this is a great example of very accessible historical nonfiction. So if you are interested in the history of religion in America, I think that this is super readable, a good place to potentially start. So there are definitely things about this that I'm enjoying. I actually also really enjoyed the introduction where the author talks about essentially him kind of realizing his own Islamophobia and that kind of inspiring this project. So I thought that that was a nice bit of self-reflection and admirable. This is how, how the world changes is us just being honest about our own failings and moving from there. But each chapter is about a different religious group in the U.S. and an example of them essentially being persecuted or the history of their persecution. It starts with the Quakers. I should mention, I was, I taught church history. I taught Christian church history as my TA position in grad school. I'm very familiar with a lot of, at least the broader contours of that. There's always room to nuance things, but the Quaker chapter that it opens with, I think is good. Didn't learn a ton in it of new things, but you know, I'm a descendant of Anne Hutchinson. So it's always exciting to see her wrapped. So that's the first chapter. The second chapter is about Catholics, which was the entire reason I picked this. And it was specifically talking about the Irish Catholic experience. Something it brought up that I hadn't really ever just like pieced together before is today in the US, we think of Boston as like one of the most Catholic cities in the US. But it was originally founded as a Puritan, like specifically very anti Catholic place, which is an interesting tension. Anyway, I just hadn't particularly thought of that before. But anyway, so it's talking about the history of prejudice specifically against Irish Catholics as being both unchristian and un-American. The third chapter I really enjoyed because it was about the history of essentially persecuting Native Americans for their religions that they had that were obviously different than Christianity. And specifically, it is connecting the history of the Sioux people with ghost dancing as a a part of their their religious traditions and how that was connected to the massacre of Wounded Knee, which is something I did not know about and was just, I thought that that's the chapter I've like learned the most new stuff from. And I thought that that was super interesting. This makes me want to get to, I have a audio book of the indigenous people's history of the United States that I keep meaning to read and I certainly should. In general, I feel like I am overdue for some deeper dives on Native American history, more information about different Native American cultures, etc. That is a huge gap in our history teaching here in the US. I don't know how it is now. I can't imagine it's a lot better, but when I was a kid, that is a huge gap. Like you basically would learn about indigenous cultures pre-European arrival. And then you don't really hear about their experience except as sort of like footnotes. So like you hear about like the Trail of Tears, but it's always just framed as like, whoops, that was our bad. Like we probably shouldn't have done that. But there's not really a reckoning with the genocide and the thievery. Like I don't feel like that was really reckoned with very honestly in my personal schooling growing up. So that is something that as an adult, I should and would like to rectify. So anyway, this just reminded me that I should invest some time in doing that. Uh, and then the fourth chapter was about specifically the history of the Klan and Judaism. And I think that it does a good job of talking about essentially like new ideas of race that were emerging in the 19th century and how the Jewish identity as both a religion and an ethnicity sort of fed into some of those conversations and essentially how Jewish people were sort of victims of some of that discourse going on at the time. And specifically, specifically talks about what a racist, anti-Semitic piece of shit Henry Ford is, which true. So yeah, so far, I mean, I guess the only thing that I have as like a critique is that I think that this is necessarily cutting a lot of context out of things. So for instance, in the Catholic chapter, like I would have enjoyed him exploring how the Irish immigration wave into the US was happening at the same time that the Pope and kind of like centralized Catholic religion was really doubling down on certain doctrines around church authority as a response to its loss of kind of temporal power, geopolitically, its position in the world. I think that that would have been a nice nuancing or like deepening of kind of the overall cultural context that a lot of that prejudice was happening in. 
but that is a very nitpicky thing and like I don't think it's right to critique books for not doing something that they're not trying to do. This is trying to keep things pretty like digestible, have a very specific like thread of investigation and what it's talking about. So I think it is doing a good job of that. And let's see here what I know that the next chapter is on Mormonism, which I will be interested in. I have been loving Mormon stories podcast recently. So I'm here for that. So that one is labeled as fanatics. Okay, so we had heretics for the Quakers in the first chapter, un-American and un-Christian for Catholics in the second, and evens for the Sioux in the third, a race apart for Jews in the fourth, fanatics for Mormons in the fifth, and then it's going to be, ooh, it's not a religion, it's a cult, the Branch Davidian. That is interesting. And then the sum of all fears, Islamophobia and anti-Muslim sentiment today. This was written, I think, in 2013. So that makes sense, sort of post-Bush era when we were still deeply enmeshed in Iraq and Afghanistan. So yeah, that's where we are. This is interesting, good. Don't necessarily think it's like a favorite, but I'm enjoying this as historical nonfiction on topics that I'm very interested in. I'm always interested in the history of religion and belief. And this ties in, I think, very nicely to the card because the Pope slash Hierophant card is all about sort of institutionalized religion or sort of traditional paths. And this is basically exploring how like there is a specific traditional religious path in the US that these different groups do and don't conform to. So anyway, I'll check back in. Actually, I'll probably just, I'll talk to you guys in the wrap up because I think by the time I'm ready to wrap this up, I should be ready to wrap everything up. So I'll give you my final thoughts in that and we'll wrap this whole thing up. I'll see you then. Okay, my loves, we are officially done. And this is my ranked stack. If we're counting Empire of Sand, it is the clear winner. And we are definitely counting Death in the Dancing Footman, and that is the clear loser. American Heretics ended up being good. I would say the best chapters were definitely the one on ghost dancing with the Sioux and about Jews and the history, the con like what constitutes an ethno religion. I thought those were the best chapters, but overall I would give it like three and a half stars. Okay, so if we're going to count Empire of Sand, considering that the Empress card, which if you will recall, was the one that I had the hardest time deciding what I was gonna do for it, uh, the Empress card definitely won because I would say Empire of Sand and the Empress of Salt and Fortune were both really good. If we're not going to consider this in the stack, I guess we would say the Hermit card won because I would say Piranesi really enjoyed and, and was definitely my favorite of the core five. I gave these two four stars, these two three and a half stars, and this two stars. So I'd say overall, the cards definitely helped me pick mostly books that I either really liked or loved. So I mean, and it, you know, I did not enjoy this one, but it did help me get that book off my TBR and it has been there for a while. So yeah, I'm gonna say the Empress and the Hermit card are two winners, but overall a successful TBR outing. And if you don't wanna hear anything else about tarot, at this point you can exit because the reading vlog portion is over. Godspeed, blessings upon you. In terms of my thoughts on tarot, okay. So I've been in like a spiritual crisis is too strong, but I've been like contemplating recently my relationship with spirituality because I definitely have moved into a post evangelical and mostly post Christian perspective. I guess I think of myself as sort of like philosophically Christian, but I don't really identify with any of the dogma. Yeah, so I've been sort of in a weird nebulous place with spirituality, but I do, it's like I, I can't fully believe the way that I used to in the supernatural, but I like the idea of the supernatural. So I've been trying to do a little more tarot recently to just sort of channel my receptiveness to that kind of thing. And I think I mostly, my friend uh, sent me an article recently on NPR about how tarot isn't really predictive of the future, but it can help you be self-reflective and like channel your own intuition. And I think that's basically how I feel about tarot. I feel like it's an opportunity for you to ask questions and kind of like have a guided way to be reflective. And the spread I was doing was specifically about, the question I was asking was about like, how can I try to find a way to have spirituality like reincorporated into my life? And the reading was very telling, or at least it helped me channel my feelings. So card one is the present situation. So that's the hermit. As we talked about, that is often like about seeking spirituality and like seeking inner guidance. So hello, very relevant. Card two is what's hidden or what's obstructing or undermining you. And the death card is all about transformation. And since mine was in reverse, it's like, I'm not willing to let go of 
kind of my old way of thinking about spirituality was kind of how I interpreted that as blocked by my own preconceptions of what belief or participation in supernaturalness means. So I thought that was pretty relevant. Card three is your structures, strengths, or supports, which again, I felt like actually ended up being a really big hit on the nose because that was the student card that the page of wands is really associated with optimism and seeking and learning. And uh, I mentioned that I kind of, when I was first thinking about it, realized it was very similar to a Sagittarius. I'm a Sagittarius rising and I very much identify with that as sort of like a rising sign. Um, so I do think that that tends to be a strength. I'm a good student and I am a pretty glass half full kind of gal. Card four is your fears, weaknesses, or adversaries of like what might hold you back. And the Empress card in reverse, this idea of like possibly being too focused on trying to just get through the drudgery of day-to-day -day life and therefore not being connected with spirituality. That was kind of how I interpreted that. And then the fifth card is how to best handle the situation and or a person who can help you. And the fact that that was the Hierophant slash the Pope card. What I took from that was a combination of both like not being afraid to reject spiritual authorities that I've had in the past, but also not being afraid to look to other potential sources of spiritual authority in the future. That was sort of my takeaway from that. So anyway, all of that pretty much aligns with my intuition. And I think that that reading in particular resonated with me, it was just a good way for me to channel my own self-reflectiveness. So that's kind of how I think about tarot. And this whole thing has just reminded me that I enjoy it. And it's a good way, like I said, to just sort of help you meditate on a pressing question and give you some like prompts and guidance on thinking that through. If you care at all about my thoughts on tarot, that's what they are. And aside from helping me read some great books, it also is helping me think through maybe some next steps in my ongoing spiritual journey. That will do it for this vlog. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I also enjoyed everybody guessing the cards on Instagram. That was fun. You guys did a great job. I don't think I was super sneaky about it, but anyway, you guys did a great job there. Definitely let me know what you thought about any of the books I talked about, what you think about tarot, etc. in the comments below. And yeah, I think that will do it for this video. So if you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social means if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below, and I think that that will do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day today, and I will just talk to you soon.